All right, let's get started. Um, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, we really appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, we're excited to talk a little bit about one of the biggest legislative victories of this session, which is the banning of toxic trichloroethylene, or what we'll call TCE throughout this webinar. Um, it's really a great piece of legislation, frankly, and it's surprising that you could get this done on a, in an era of gridlock and a time of COVID-19, but we're super happy about it. We want to talk a little bit about how this came about and what it means for Minnesota. Um, we want to welcome all of our donors, especially our sustaining members, and a special welcome for uh, action takers. Um, there was an action alert that went out right before uh, this vote got taken, and it was a really important moment that helped get this over the finish line. So thank you for those folks who are there, who are here today because of that invitation. Um, my name is Aaron Clems. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Uh, and on the other line here for the webinar to talk about this issue is Cara Josephson, our Legislative Director. So Cara, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Cara Josephson. I'm a Legislative Director at MCEA. Uh, Prior to working at MCA, I lobbied for um, a few other environmental organizations, and prior to that, I spent several years working at the Minnesota Senate. So I have um, some experience from the inside on how things work, and I'm very excited to be at MCEA to be able to utilize that um, expertise to help advance policies here, um, like TCE. Great. So uh, I'm gonna get started by just talking a little bit about um, TCE in a moment, but first I wanna start by talking a little bit about these webinars. This is a series of webinars we're doing to keep our donors and supporters in the know about our work. Um, and we've been doing this work here in Minnesota to protect Minnesota's environment, defend the health of its people for almost 50 years. Um, Cara's gonna talk a little bit at first though about our legislative program and how we do legislative work. So Cara, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Erin. I'm happy to talk about our legislative program. So most of you probably are familiar with MCEA and our work in the courts. Um, we've got a full team of lawyers. We're very active, um, you know, uh, for decades have been um, involved in several um, different lawsuits. But, you know, we also utilize our legal expertise at the Capitol as well. Um, so, you know, obviously a key part of MC's work at the Capitol is to defend the environment. Um, so that is always forefront on our mind. Um, but also a lot of our legal work actually depends on the laws that are enacted at the legislature. And oftentimes we have found that when we win in the courts, the following legislative session, our opponents will um, seek to weaken those laws. So that is definitely something that um, um, CEA plays a role at at the legislature. I'm um, just, you know, protecting our uh, key environmental, um, you know, our bedrock environmental laws. But we also look to proactive legislation as well, and we develop a legislative agenda that includes some proactive um, policies, and we did include TCE as one of our proactive legislative agenda items this session. Um, and just in terms of just briefly our legislative team, um, what for MCEA this session, we had myself, um, Andrea Lovell, our legislative associate. We uh, were very lucky to have uh, former representative Kate Knuth, who serves as our uh, climate policy advisor. We also had um, Anam Amhuri, um, who served as our Capital Pathways intern, and uh, Aaron, uh, working as our public engagement director. And I think also what really makes MCEA unique to other environmental organizations at the Capitol is that we have a team of lawyers at our disposal. MCEA has a staff of lawyers who are, um, you know, have steeped in environmental law and have expertise in that area. So they are part of our legislative team as well. And we uh, lean on them all the time for advice and expertise. And they helped us as well with the, um, TCE legislation. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the TCE ban, specifically what happened, what TCE is. And I want to start with that because it's one of, uh, it's a very common chemical. Uh, it's been used for decades as a solvent and a degreaser. Um, and it was so commonly used that in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, before people were aware of how toxic it was, it was disposed of really carelessly. Um, so, for example, I live in Fridley. Um, Fridley and North New Brighton have had 
decades long struggles with providing clean and safe drinking water to their residents because of TCE in the drinking water table. Um, within about a three mile radius of my house in Fridley, there are four federal Superfund sites, all of which were uh, Superfund sites because of TCE or at least in part. Um, and one of them, they described how after the shift was over at the FMC Corp, uh, they would simply just toss the used solvent out the back door onto their gravel, uh, gravel parking lot. And so because of that kind of willy-nilly disposal, there are literally dozens of sites across Minnesota that have substantial contamination of groundwater um, from TCE. That includes even Finland, Minnesota, a little tiny hamlet up there in the North Shore. But during the 1960s and 70s, the US Air Force had a radar station and they would just pour TCE on the filters for the radar array uh, to clean them out, and they would just do that on the ground. Uh, now you can't sink a well within a five mile radius of that site uh, in Finland, Minnesota. So it's been a really long standing problem. Uh, it also contaminates air. And, and the reason why this came to the fore recently was because of the Water Gremlin case in, in White Bear Township. Uh, Water Gremlin is a manufacturer that makes lead parts um, for sinkers, which you shouldn't use. You should use less toxic alternatives than lead. Um, but also they uh, produce lead acid battery terminals. So that car, your car battery, they make the, the lead terminals that are on those batteries. And the last step in that process is to take the, to take the grease off of it. So they would run it through a degreasing system. Uh, but what happened this about 18 months ago was it revealed that uh, Water Gremlin was supposed to be capturing all of this TCE vapor and recycling it for use inside of their plants so that it wouldn't escape. But instead, literally millions of pounds of TCE was being discharged into the air in violation of their air permit for 14 years. Uh, the folks who lived nearby were exposed to unsafe levels of trichloroethylene. And this is a chemical that we know causes cancer, it causes birth defects. And the shock to the system uh, from the residents nearby really led to a quick action. Um, the MPCA issued a $7 million fine and a corrective action, which is, I think, I think the largest, if not the largest, uh, certainly the largest in recent history in Minnesota, um, and also caused them to uh, form a citizens group to try to prevent um, and to address the aftermath of this uh, contamination once it was revealed. Um, and into the credit of the citizens group, they succeeded not only in getting Water Gremlin to stop using TCE and adopt a safer alternative, but they also didn't stop there. And they continued because they believed that no community should have to go through what they did. Um, and as a result of that, um, even after getting Water Gremlin to transition to other chemicals, they just kept on going. And that set the stage for a two year long legislative battle to try to ban trichloroethylene here in the state of Minnesota. And MCEA played a significant role in that coalition and I want to turn it over to Carr to talk a little bit about what role we play. Great, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned um, the White Bear Area um, Concerned Citizens Group because they really did play a key role. I mean, they were the impetus for this legislation even being um, developed and really truly passed. But MCEA, you know, we had identified this as an issue of concern to us prior to the legislative session and once we saw this um, citizens group getting engaged, we wanted to jump in and help and, you know, contribute um, our expertise and help um, collaborate there. So what we did first is we uh, utilized our um, GIS specialist and asked her to develop um, a map of all of the TCP TCE permits throughout the state. Oh no. It looks like Cara is frozen up. Um, it's particularly. So we, go. We, um, we took that map and we, um, we took that map and we put, turned it into a fact sheet and then we worked um, to distribute that to other legislators and uh, you know, partners and allies and we really tried to use that information to um, enhance the um, citizens group efforts to pass the bill. Uh, we also worked closely with other environmental organizations and um, actually with the uh, Pollution Control Agency as well. And um, we uh, provided committee testimony. In fact, we were actually the only organization to uh, testify in committee uh, on this important issue because um, 
not surprisingly, the legislature is not always accessible to your average citizen who has a full-time job and family and who's working all day. And so, um, you know, uh, fortunately, we were able to be there and we're able to provide some testimony and our fa um, and the fact sheet. Um, but also, you know, one of the, um, the biggest um, things that happened at the end of session is that we got involved or we were involved and we really pushed the PCA and um, the legislators and the um, citizens group, just the three of them to sit down together and, and come to an agreement and negotiate and ultimately um, you know, they actually were able to come to an agreement and uh, were able to pass the bill. And, um, you know, hand it over off to Aaron here to maybe talk about some of the um, the next steps. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also important to note because it's, it's something that, you know, we haven't discussed directly yet is the unusual nature of this legislative session. Um, so uh, at about mid-March, the legislature stopped meeting in person for a time or severely limited their, their meetings. And so because of that, um, it became really challenging to make sure that legislation got over the finish line. Obviously, and for good reason, the legislature was very focused on responding to the crisis in front of them, which is COVID-19. Um, but at the same time, they did continue to do other work. And one of the challenges with this was to make sure that we were raising the profile of this issue so that it got to the top of the stack. Otherwise, a lot of other good ideas that could have gotten done this legislative session got left behind. And so um, we were pleased to be able to do that, um, and in particular, you know, there was a, a good push because of the bipartisan makeup of the legislative co the legislative legislators that represent that area. Right, so you had Senator Roger Chamberlain, who's a Republican, um, and also Representative Amy Wasilek, who was a Democrat, who represented the area immediately around um, the uh, the White Bear plant for water ground. Because of that the bipartisan nature of this coalition made this possible. Um, remember, Minnesota is the only state in the United States right now to have a split control of the two bodies of its legislature, where Democrats control one chamber and, and Republicans control the other. Um, and so it wouldn't have been possible to do any of this work if there wasn't a bipartisan push for it and there wasn't um, bipartisan authorship in both the Senate and the House. But luckily the result was uh, a very strong bill. Um, this issue came up in 2019 as well, um, obviously after the Water Gremlin case broke, um, but nothing got finished that session. There was a lot of discussion. There was uh, some money set aside for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency though to start asking um, and inventorying which users were using TCE and encourage them to adopt alternatives. And a number of them did so voluntarily. And I think that was part of the reason why we were able to get this over the finish line. I mean, I, I saw John Wells' um, comment in the chat room about why this didn't get done earlier. That's a great question. Um, you know, it really was because of opposition from the chemical industry. Um, really, that was what stopped it in 2019. And it wasn't until um, the negotiations really switched to being between the citizens, the MPCA, and the legislators, and not the chemical industry, uh, did we finally start to see some progress towards. Um, and the result was a good bill, um, a bill that bans the use of TCE by June 2022 with some limited exceptions, mostly for medical research and other users that use very small quantities for um, research purposes, not for the degreasing and um, large scale uses that we see elsewhere. Another thing that was important was that money was provided or access to an existing small business loan fund was provided for small businesses that want to transition from their use of TCE. Um, this is important because a lot of small auto parts and auto um, repair businesses use small quantities of TCE to decrease auto parts. And so without access to some funds to help them identify and transition to alternatives, that might take longer. And so we were glad to see that made it into the bill as well. But one of the biggest things was uh, a provision, and this was a pretty big sticking point in the negotiation, was how to make sure that alternatives were less toxic than what was being proposed, what was being used right now. Um, so obviously there needs to be a lot of different, a lot of different approaches. Um, I also want to add, you know, and, and John, I see you chiming in too. I'll add one more thing to this, which was this Minnesota came to this in part because the national um, EPA failed to do their job. Um, in 2016, there was movement toward banning TCE at the national level. 
or at least putting severe restrictions on the use of TCE. It's been known to be a damaging and cancer-causing chemical for a long time. Um, but as you know, the transition uh, of administrations in 2016 led to big changes in the way that the EPA thought about how they do their job and the TCE ban was dropped at the national level. And so now it's gonna be up to states like Minnesota to demonstrate leadership. Um, and Minnesota is the leader. We are the first state in the nation to do this, to ban this toxic chemical. Um, Erin Brockovich herself has been saying great things about Minnesota's leadership on social media and on television. Um, and this is a really big win for Minnesota. And so we're glad to talk about it today. Um, you know, but we also learned some things about how we can make better laws at the Capitol through this whole experience. I want to turn it back over to Kara for just a moment for her to talk a little bit about what we've learned in this process. Yeah, well, I mean, what we've seen is that um, if absolutely, if there is a local um, activated group of citizens, that that makes a huge difference. Uh, I mean, the chief authors of both bills, Senator Chamberlain in the Senate and Representative Wazowick in the House, uh, were responding really directly to their constituents, and that made all the difference. So, to the extent that local citizens can get activated and engage and work with their legislators, that um, seems to be you know, a very effective, effective tool. And then when MCA can partner with them and provide, um, you know, and utilize our legal and policy expertise or mapping, um, you know, in-house mapping, all of that, I, I think we're even stronger. We're stronger together. So that was certainly a lesson learned. Um, also, just uh, when there is an actual, I think, specific kind of uh, localized example of something that has happened, that there's an actual kind of problem that we're looking to solve in a um, location that um, has, an, has an issue, we can, and that's helpful. I mean, I'm referencing Water Gremlin. If it were not for Water Gremlin, I don't know if the issue would have um, been given the urgency that that it um, had at the capital. So just having uh, we want an actual disaster or local problem to be happening, but if, if that happens, it's kind of helpful to you know, um, look at the location where it is, who are the constituents there, the community groups, and then um, you know they can engage directly with the legislator. That's that's huge. Um, but then also another important. An uh, important part that I would like to add that Erin kind of mentioned earlier about the chemical industry, uh, the, the business industry was very, very strongly represented at, at the Capitol with this coming to this bill. In fact, that is um, largely the reason why it failed to pass last session. It had bipartisan support, it had broad support. Uh, in fact, it passed both bodies uh, several times in different committees and even on the floor in some cases. Um, but at the very end of session, the uh, Chamber of Commerce really um, played a role in, in, not, um, in stopping that. that was last so this session, towards the end there, during the negotiations, the Chamber was not at the table. It was just the Pollution Control Agency, the local citizens group, um, and the legislators themselves. And because of that, I think they were able to actually um, come to an agreement. Yeah. Sorry to do this, but Cara, you're kind of breaking up. Your internet connection has been really unstable for the last couple of times. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to transition and try to take over a little bit of the Q and A just so we can make sure folks can hear. Um, but I wanted to like just kind of sum up what's next. I mean, we we still have a lot of work to do on this. Um, we have to monitor the implementation of this. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to transition a number of users away from a chemical they've used for a long time and to make sure that the alternatives they're adopting are less toxic. Um, and, and when you're talking about degreasing in solvents, there can be uh, a range of alternatives ranging from steam and hot water all the way to chemicals that are just as toxic or even more so sometimes than TCE. And so the inclusion of that language in the legislation was really important and it's gonna be important for citizens groups and for groups like MCEA to make sure we're staying on top of the implementation of this act so that folks are actually you know, their health is improved as opposed to threatened by other chemicals. And, you know, the other thing that we need to do is make sure that Minnesota knows, that folks know that Minnesota is a leader on this. Um, if other states can take our example and move forward with this, even with the absence of federal leadership, we can make a big, we can make a big change. And um, it's been a long time coming. 
um, and we're thrilled to actually have gotten this over the finish line this time. And thank you to everybody who made this possible, including folks who donated to make it possible for us to build this strong and robust legislative team. And also thanks to the folks who took action near the end of this process to make sure that we pushed this over the finish line. Because I can let, I, I will tell you without disclosing too much that there was a time where this was very much in doubt. Um, and it wasn't long before the end of the session. So it was really important that folks spoke up when they were asked to do so. So thank you. All right, um, I wanna move on to Questions, do we have some questions in the chat? Oh, I got another one by email. Let me let me ask this and see if, um, Cara, we'll see if, if you're not breaking up anymore. Um, this is obviously just one thing that happened to the legislature. What are, what are other things that happened and didn't happen? What's coming up next? I mean, we've heard uh, potential for a special session uh, in June, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the other things that happen in the legislature. And if you're still breaking up, I might have to break in and try to redirect traffic. But we'll give it a try and see how it goes. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I guess one of the uh, many issues that we're all dealing with, we're working uh, remotely yeah. during because uh, normally we would be in our wonderful, amazing uh, MCA office, but we don't have that, so I apologize. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the legislative session was kind of a, a very interesting one. Um, unfortunately, not a lot got accomplished, uh, largely due to a person, unfortunately, because uh, we are the only um, uh, divided legislature in the state or in the country. So of course that poses uh, major issues, but also the COVID-19 I'm what we're dealing with Actually, what we're dealing with right now is interesting exactly what the legislators were dealing with. Um, they had to switch all of their operations to doing everything remotely. Um, they even conducted their uh, four sessions remotely, something that never happened before. So it was a very interesting. I'm sorry, Cara. It's just it's not getting it's better. It's not getting better. Yeah, it's gonna. It's we're gonna have to. Um, I, I can try to jump in here a little bit because I think mine's a little bit more stable. Um, okay. Just just to kind of explain things, and if you you if you're saying this, that means I've gone too far. Um, but in any case, I, I agree with, you know, Cara is exactly right. This was an unprecedented session and what it led to at the end was kind of gridlock. I mean, if, I don't know if any of you watched any of the legislative proceedings, but they have to do a literal roll call vote for all 134 members of the House every time they would do a vote. And it added a huge amount of time and inefficiency to that process, which is already pretty inefficient. Um, but the bottom line is disagreements about COVID-19 and the governor's emergency powers stopped some really important legislation, particularly a bonding bill. And one of the things that MCEA was working on alongside our partners at other environmental groups, but also cities and engineers across the state was trying to get $300 million of water infrastructure bonding completed as part of that bonding package. And that did not happen. Um, that will probably be live, a live issue in June. Um, according to the statements of, this, of uh, Melissa Hortman, the Speaker of the House, and Paul Gazelka, the Majority Leader of the Senate, they had agreed on a number uh, for a bonding bill, but that was stopped by um, disagreements with the Minority Caucus, uh, particularly uh, Minority Leader Kurt Dow, who refused to let any of his members vote for a package unless the governor agreed to stop the emergency order related to COVID-19. Um, um, one other question, like John brought up a question in the chat that I think is really good um, and we're and worth merging with is about emerging contaminants. Um, you know, he says there's got to be a better way for us to deal with emerging contaminants, which have been emerging for 30 to 50 years. And you're exactly right about that. These are basically manufactured chemicals now in the environment that we may not have definitive health or environmental implications on. Any ideas? Um, it's a great question. Um, it's really sad that we're losing Representative Gene Wagenius, who's been really on top of this question of emerging contaminants for a very long time. They're also called contaminants of emerging concern. Um, and one of the things that's ironic about this is that in the United States, we don't require that chemicals be tested to be safe before we start using them. <laughs> um, and we oftentimes catch up years later when we realize the harm of those, that those chemicals cause. I think a good example is neonicotinoid insecticides. Uh, we're just starting to understand that these kinds of pesticides, which were thought to be relatively safe, have a lot of spillover effects on, on bees and other pollinators and are doing extreme environmental damage in places. And so 
Um, I think to answer your question, John, is a lot of folks, um, you know, it's going to take some work to identify what contaminants are out there already, and there's more every year. But it would be a, a great idea for us to adopt the precautionary principle as a way of thinking about these chemicals before we start certifying their use and sale uh, to make sure that they're safe before we start to use them. All right, we got one more question. Um, what was the biggest challenge in this bill passed? Um, I don't know. We'll try one more time with Cara. How are you doing, Cara? Let's, let's give it a go. All right. Can you hear me okay? Is it hopefully working okay? Um, the, biggest, the biggest challenge, I think, kind of as I mentioned earlier, was um, just the, the business industry and their interests um, and the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and large industrials, just all of, all of those issues um, actually lobbying against the bill at the Capitol. And I, uh, unfortunately, as much as it seems like we have so many actively engaged um, citizens and just organize environmental organizations too, but the reality is that at the Capitol, in terms of the actual, you know, lobbyists who are lobbying the legislators, we are vastly outspent and outnumbered. There are far more um, lobbyists at the Capitol who have legislators' ears who are representing business interests than there are um, representing the environment or actually the people, <laughs> which is yeah. the, the truth. So I think that's the that's that's probably the biggest issue. And I mean, I hate to say this, but really, the the Senate um, right now probably it played a, a a roadblock too. I mean, the the House. The past usually in the house. There were really no issues with um, having this bill passed in the house. It was really Senate that posed, posed the problems. So breaking up a little bit, but that mostly got through. I think that was pretty understandable. Um, I do like the suggestion that you should grow a beard like mine to improve your reception. I'm not sure that's really relevant <laughs> to <laughs> the problems we're experiencing. Um, one last question, and I, I can take in um, field, is uh, from John Helland, John's former board chair of MCEA, um, did the Senate pass their environment omnibus bill and did the Environment Trust Fund appropriations get approved? Good question. Um, both the House and the Senate passed versions of an, uh, an environment omnibus bill that contained everything from, you know, things like, you know, small land sale appro uh, approvals by the legislature, things that are consensus that the Department of Natural Resources usually puts forward. Um, and also both versions, both versions in the House and the Senate included appropriations from the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Um, folks may recall that we went to court last year to prevent the sale of bonds that would have raided that fund. Um, but that hasn't ended controversy over the use of that fund for what we believe are unconstitutional purposes. And so that had held up uh, passage of the bill. So at the very late parts of the session, there was movement on this question and both bodies passed their own version of a bill, but they were unable to negotiate a compromise version. And so because of that, when the legislature adjourned at the end of that, um, at the end of session, it was not approved and sent to the governor. Uh, but it is heartening and potentially, you know, it could be a sign of progress that both bodies were able to pass versions of the bill that included the Environment Natural Resources Trust Fund appropriations. And we're hopeful that in the June special session, this will actually get over the finish line. Mm -hmm. And if my internet connection is hopefully still working, I would just like to add that, um, you know, MCA, we did play a direct role in fighting against um, the Senate, uh, the many troubling provisions in the Senate um, Environment Omnibus Bill. We testified numerous times, uh, we put together actually a quite comprehensive written testimony that is posted on our website. So I would encourage all of you, if you have not done so, if you're interested to uh, visit our at the legislature uh, webpage. And we do have our written testimony posted there. Uh, we were also actually, uh, uh, you know, text lot kind of um, working with um, the legislators, our legislative allies as a debating on the Senate floor. So if you're really interested in watching a Senate floor debate, um, you can check out the on this bill, um, on the environmental debates. And um, there were some yeah. points. If, right it, if that didn't get through it was a little bit garbled, I'll just reiterate that we keep all of our written testimony and all of our fact sheets that we distribute to legislators on our website. It's easy to find if you go to mncenter.org. 
the top left hand corner, there's a little, what they call a hamburger menu. There's three lines. If you click on that, there's a drop down menu that says at the legislature. And you can go see where we testified, what our testimony was, um, fact sheets we provided. At the very top of that, lit, of that list of fact sheets is the Senate bill that we were talking about. And in the interest of time, it's probably not able to go through. I mean, there, there were literally over 100 pages, including, yeah, I think, something like 92 policy sections. About 20 or 30 of those are real stinkers. Um, and we were glad to be able to stop those, or at least they didn't become law this time around. But it's a little bit beyond the scope of our time here today, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to have to move on and, and uh, put this, put this uh, a little bit to, to, to an end here. I want to make sure we're honoring people's time. We like to keep these to a half hour. But just a couple of things before we go. I want to, again, reiterate, thank you to our donors and supporters. Um, we can't do this work without you, and we really appreciate it. That's part of the reason why we do these webinars, uh, to give you an inside look at the legislature and also at our legal cases that we're prosecuting on behalf of Minnesota's environment and the health of its people. So thank you for that. Um, secondly. Um, please follow us on social media. We keep people up to date up to the second on the social media channels, including on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And all of these are MCEA1974. MCEA1974, which is the year of our founding. We're coming in close to 50 years at this point. Um, lastly, I just wanted to let, reiterate for those folks who are on this because they were invited because they took action near the end of the legislative session on this bill. Thank you. I mean, I can't stress enough that especially right now where there's a, you know, there's no rallies happening at the Capitol. There's no people packing uh, committee hearings and there's no ability for folks to have direct in-person contact with their legislators. And it makes things like phone calls and emails when you're being asked to take action even more important. Um, at the end of legislative session, we had over 800 people in our network contact their legislators about, um, about bills. I think, I think if we added them all up, it'd be over a thousand people. That had a huge impact. Um, and I want to thank everybody who's part of that for doing it because we can't do this work without you. So we look forward to uh, coming back in June to fight it out again at the, the special session. But we wanted to make sure that we spent a little bit of time today to celebrate what is probably the largest win we've had at the legislature in the last couple of years when it comes to passing proactive legislation that's going to make Minnesota a safer and healthier place. And so, uh, again, thank you to the folks in White Bear Lake. Uh, thanks, thanks to all of you for your support and your action. And we look forward to working uh, together with you again as we move forward. Um, one last quick reminder, you'll get an email with this, um, a link to recording for this whole webinar. Um, we will also follow up if there's any questions we haven't addressed in that email. So thank you again. Uh, for your work and watch out also for our legislative update email that should go out later today or early tomorrow that recaps the entire session. So again, this is Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy's TCE webinar. We appreciate your attending during the day and hope you have a great day. Thanks so much. We appreciate it.